Thanks, Glenn and Abby. It is so good to be with you today. My name is Sam. I'm part of the community here at St. Mary's. If you've been with us for a little while, um, then you will know that over the last few weeks we were talking about This Is Us, and we just finished our series, This Is Us, looking at what it means to be kind of Christians here in Andover and in our town and how we're kind of part of St. Mary's and what it means to be part of this community uh, and how this community operates in our world and in our town. Um, and this week we're starting a new series called This Is Love in the run up to Easter. Um, we've got to continue that This Is theme, guys. So This Is Love is this week. Uh, and um, what we're going to be talking about over this time is we're looking at the cross. And the reason we're looking at the cross and we've called it This Is Love is because Easter is this moment where love is expressed in the most full and beautiful way. It is the moment where everything changes. It is the hinge moment in history and it is the moment where God's love is expressed in the most amazing and full way. And so we've called it This is Love because God's love changes everything at Easter and it changes everything in our lives. Uh, and so when we look at Easter and when we look at the cross, what we're really looking at is the love of God expressed. Uh, and so that is what we're looking at. This is love in the run-up to Easter. Today we are in Philippians 3, verses 7 to 11. Got to get that rhyme in if it is a rhyme. So Philippians 3, verses 7 to 11. Uh, and before we get there, just a quick mention about Philippians, written by Paul, a letter written to the church in Philippi. Uh, and Paul is in prison at this point. Lots of people think it was written around AD 61. Uh, and he's writing to the Philippians because they have given him a um, thank you gift. And so, a, uh, sorry, a thank you gift. They've given him a gift while he's in prison. And he is writing a thank you letter to them. Uh, and as we go through, we get this kind of beautiful encouragement and the, the, this kind of um, reminder about the faith and about the gospel. Um, and here we are in Philippians 3, verses 7 to 11, uh, just a little bit of context, but let's give it a read now. But whatever was, whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having, righteousness, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead, from the dead. Guys, I don't know how you find epistles, letters in the New Testament, but sometimes, even though it's this beautiful language going on, I can sometimes get to the end of reading a bit of them and just feel like I've got like this jumble of words and I'm not quite sure what was going on there. It's not normally that complicated, but sometimes when I read um, the epistles and these letters in the New Testament, I do just feel a little bit like that. And then as you spend time with them, as you let them kind of marinate in your heart and in your soul, you suddenly pick up these beautiful rhythms that are going throughout. You pick up this beautiful message that Paul is trying to communicate here. Um, and just think about the context in which it's written. It is written uh, while Paul is in prison, like I say, but Paul is a Jewish Christian. He is a Jewish leader of the church, as all the leaders of the church in the first century were, or uh, a significant proportion of them were. And so... Um, he is writing uh, just before our passage in verses uh, five and six, uh, sorry, four, and five, four to six, he says this, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. And then he goes on and kind of ticks off this list of like achievements for first century Jews. And he kind of is like, I was circumcised. I was from the people of Israel. I was a, uh, from the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Pharisee. I um, had zeal. I was persecuting the church. It's kind of like in the culture, in the world that I grew up in. Guys, I had it all. I was ticking all the boxes. I was on the fast track. Um, it was amazing. Uh, that is what Paul is saying. And then we get to this passage. And in verse 7, he says, but, what, what, but whatever was to my profit, so whatever I gained, whatever the achievements were that I gained, I now consider loss 
for the sake of Christ. That is to say, as he goes on talking in this passage, what he's saying is, you know, all those achievements, that list of things that I ticked off, when they're compared to Christ, when they're held in the light of Christ, they're just like almost valueless, they're devalued, they're pointless, because in the light of Christ, everything changes. Because with Jesus, you kind of encounter something of infinite value, of no comparison to anything else. That is what Paul is saying. When we encounter Jesus, all these lists, all the things that we grow up with expecting to do, just become pointless and, um, and become less important in the light of him. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I think of it a little bit like a road, and I think sort of I'm driving down a road, and it's the road that, it's the road, let's call it the road of the world, guys. I'm driving down the road, and it's this kind of environment in which I grew up in, it's the, it's the world in which I grew up in, and as I go down the road, I see um, this sort of way of Jesus as, a, as, a, as an offshoot of the road, as a, as a junction. And I look at it, and I think, you know what, um, I want to go that way. And so I kind of uh, turn in and I, and I decide I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow this way. But behind me, I have like trailers and trailers and trailers of stuff that I have just gained in my life, in my world, in my culture that I have grown up in. It's, it's the list of achievements. It's the list of insecurity. It's the list of um, anger and hurt. It's the trailers and truckful of stuff that I gain as I drive through the world and the culture that we grow up in and we exist in. And we say, you know what, I'm going to take the way of Jesus. I'm going to turn off and I'm going to take the way of Jesus. And we find ourselves driving down and it feels like it's just really difficult to get down this road because we've got to take the truck. We've got to get down there. But it just feels like it's getting heavier and heavier and heavier as we go down the road uh, of the way of Jesus. And the, the story of the cross, the story of Easter, is the story of God, of Jesus, coming to us and saying, you don't need all this stuff. You don't need to carry it all. You don't need to take all the trailers. Get out of the car and just walk with me. And so it's the story of letting all of these things go. And and, you know, from the outside, it might look like we're losing all of this stuff that we gained. We've got to, got to keep hold of it. But Jesus says, you know what? It just doesn't matter. And when we're, when we're face to face with him, we realise that what it might look like from the outside of losing all this stuff, what it might look like, um, I don't know, a few years ago when we were on the other road, it turns out it's nothing like that. Because being with Jesus is nothing but gain. Being with Jesus is life and life in all its fullness. Being with Jesus is like living in a new kingdom. And so at the beginning of our passage, that's what we get. We get this reminder that sometimes we kind of carry all these things with us. We try and take all the things that we've achieved with us, that we've um, had done to us with us. Um, but with Jesus, we, we, we actually end up carrying it all as loss and saying, you know what, uh, we don't need it. We just need him. And that's what Paul says at the beginning. Uh, and then as we move through the passage, we kind of get to this moment which helps us to understand something, which I sometimes, when I was growing up in church, um, struggled to get. And maybe you've been around church for a while and, and you've heard all this stuff about forgiveness and all of the rest of it. Uh, and you feel like it just doesn't quite make sense. I don't get what we're actually talking about with the cross. Well, Paul says, verse 8, I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having, right, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. And again, you might think, well, I'm still none the wiser. First thing to say, righteousness is this word that is kind of used in the Bible. And what it means is that we are right with God. So that's a way that might be helpful. It's a, it's a way of saying we've been made right with God. Um, it's a bit like when you're in a friendship and I suppose you kind of have an argument or something. And you know when you've got that thing kind of going around in your head and you just, it just doesn't feel quite right. You don't feel like you're in the right place or a good place with those people. Righteousness is when, you, um, when that all gets sorted out 
and you're actually in just an amazing place with your friend because you've, it's been made right. You've put the argument down. You've forgiven each other. It's okay. And so um, this sort of Chris, Christian witness of the cross is, is the witness, is the story, is the promise that we get God's righteousness. We get the righteousness of Jesus that he obtains on the cross. Um, and you might think of it a little bit like um, a kid. Uh, when I was a kid, I grew up in a house with eight um, other siblings, uh, sorry, seven other siblings, I was one of eight, and um, there was a lot of washing to be done. And so what, would, what often would happen is I would put on some clean clothes or whatever, and we'd be like, oh, can we go out and you know, play in the garden or go out uh, on, and, and call on someone in the street or like go in on the trampoline? And, and my parents would be like, no, because you've just put on clean clothes, so like, let's just chill out for a second or two. Um, and then you just keep pestering and pestering and pestering, guys, and then eventually they'll give in. That's the secret. Uh, and so they'd be like, yeah, okay, fine, you can go out into the garden, um, but don't get your new clothes or your clean clothes all messy and muddy. Um, and so you're like, yeah, sure, of course, I won't, I wouldn't dare. And you run out into the garden and then you're like playing and you're like playing it and you've got to dive to get away from your brother or something and, and all of this stuff and you, you're, you're, you're playing around. And as you're doing that, you start to kind of move away to deviate from the advice of your parents, right? The plan doesn't quite work out how you promised it would because you start to get the grass stains and the mud all over you. And when you get to the end, you feel like, oh no, what am I going to do? And you kind of, I don't know about you, but I would wander in and I would try and escape from my parents, try and not let them see me and get changed quickly and get my, new, my clean clothes in the wash. But then, um, and sometimes with Christianity, with God, it can feel a little bit like that, can't it? It can feel like the kind of story of the Bible is the story of God saying, there's this amazing garden, there's this amazing world for us to go and um, play in. Uh, and to work in and to live in. Um, and he gives us some advice about how to do that. Uh, and then as we kind of go and we play and we live in the garden, our intentions initially are, are completely pure to stick with the clean clothes, but we begin to kind of move away from the advice. We begin to move away from the plan. And we can sometimes find ourselves when we come to God, like those kids stood in front of him with mud and grass stains all over us, terrified about what we're about to hear. And the story of the cross is the story of God in Jesus, fully human uh, and fully God, coming to earth and saying, seeing us stood there with our clothes. And on the cross and in his resurrection, he says to us, don't worry. He doesn't punish us. He doesn't have a massive go at us. He says, don't worry, I've got some clean clothes. Just pop these on. I'll take your muddy ones and I'll clean them. I'll sort it out. Don't worry. Here are some clean ones. And so when we talk about being made right with God, when we talk about what happens on the cross, there's a whole load of things theologically that we could go into and try and unpack. But we don't have, we don't have loads of time at the moment. So for me, a helpful way to understand it is that God, he stands in front of us. He looks at us with all the things that we've done to other people, the things that we've done to ourselves, the things that we've done to God, with all the mud and the rubbish that it feels like has kind of stuck onto us. And he says, don't worry. You'll forgive them. Here are some clean clothes. Come and um, join me. And so that is the story of the cross. That is the story of Easter. It's the story of God who became man in Jesus, fully God and fully man, who lived our life, a life with us, who died on the cross and took our sin and our shame, and who in his resurrection and in his ascension, he gives us clean clothes, he gives us righteousness, he forgives us. But more than that, he invites us 
into a new kingdom. In Jesus' ascension, there is the story of him becoming king. The story of the gospel is not just the story of our forgiveness. It is not just the story of our clean clothes. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes it feels like this whole world is messed up. It feels like this whole world is living in muddy clothes, in the way that we interact with each other, in our relationships, in our communication, in the way that we treat our planet, in the way that we exist in society, in the systems and structures around us, it can feel like everyone is wearing muddy clothes. It can feel like this whole world is wearing muddy clothes. And so the story of the cross, the story of the resurrection, the story of Jesus, the story of the ascension is the story of Jesus becoming king. It is the story of God inviting us, not just into um, his, not just making us right, not just inviting us into forgiveness. It is the story of God inviting us into his kingdom. And it is a kingdom where things are being made right. It is the story of God inviting us to recreate with him, to join in the recreation of this world, to join in his kingdom, to take his passport, to take the citizenship of the kingdom of heaven and to live there. And so sometimes when we talk about how we um, experience this righteousness from God, when sometimes when we talk about how we experience this forgiveness, we talk about putting our faith in him, we talk about putting our trust in him, and some people talk about giving our allegiance to him. And it's a bit like giving our allegiance to a king, right? Because we have so many kings in our world when we're on the road of the world that we have given our allegiance to. But in the way of Jesus, he invites us to say, you know what, I'm going to put my trust, my faith, my allegiance with you, King Jesus. And it's not a kingdom of punishment. It is not a kingdom of a thousand laws. It is a kingdom that, is got, that lives in the heartbeat of love. It is a kingdom that lives in forgiveness. It is a kingdom that lives in being in recreation, in making things right. And that is the invitation of Jesus. Now, you might be sat there thinking, well, you know what, I've signed up to this thing and uh, it turns out that everything doesn't feel like it's all been made right. So what's happening? Um, And and we find in verse uh, 10, uh, Paul says um, that he wants to join in, he wants to experience the fellowship of sharing in his, Jesus's sufferings. There is this, and becoming like him in his death. There is this acknowledgement even here that when we sign up to this thing, when we become part of Jesus' kingdom, when we're made right with him, it doesn't mean everything else just is fine. It doesn't mean this kingdom is immediately ushered in. There is this thing called the now and the not yet of the kingdom of God. But it does mean that we are invited to recreate in our relationships. It does mean that we're invited to bring hope to bring love, to bring God's righteousness into our relationships, into our systems and structures, into our world, to be people who live like we are in the kingdom of God. And that is the invitation of Jesus. Now, look, we could talk forever, and I'm probably already talking too long. Um, Talking too long? Talk too long. Uh, But for me, um, the passage that sums up the cross is found in John 15, verse 13, where it says, Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And here's the the kind of miracle of the cross. Jesus laid down his life for his friends. And you and me are his friends. He says to you and me, Come and join me in this kingdom. Come and join me in this new creation. He says to you and me, here are some new clothes. And so let's just pray uh, as we come to an end. And let's invite Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. You might like to close your eyes and just take a moment. Invite Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. And I just wonder if there's some people who are kind of with us today who feel like they're on the road, on the way of Jesus, but they are dragging a whole lot of stuff behind them. Maybe you feel like you're still 
gripped on to that achievement list. Maybe you feel like you're still wearing the marks of the hurt and the pain and the shame. Maybe you still feel like you're dragging behind a whole load of things that you've done. You've done to yourself, you've done to others, and you've done to God. Let's just take a moment and maybe you want to just say to God, God, I'm sorry. Maybe you want to just offer these things that you are holding on to, to him. And we just say, Holy Spirit, we ask for your forgiveness. We ask for your freedom. We ask for your love. And we pray that today, each and every person joining us would have a reminder of that forgiveness, of that freedom, and of that love. Maybe you feel like you're joining this uh, sort of service today and you feel like, actually, you know what? I, I feel like I've signed up, I'm in, but I'm, I'm not sure that I'm living uh, like I'm part of this kingdom. I'm not sure that I'm um, holding a banner for this kingdom in my relationships, in my, uh, in my world. And so we ask, Holy Spirit, again, would you set a fire deep within our souls? Would you give us eyes and ears to see opportunities to engage in your creation in this world? To bring your kingdom and would you give us the courage to do it? Amen. Amen. Let's worship.